So welcome everybody. Um, so uh, today we have the pleasure to host Christina Plainaki. Um, Christina. So a few words about Christina. She's a planetary and solar system scientist. She works at the Italian Space Agency with activity in the fields of uh, circumterrestrial and planetary space weather. Uh, Christina got her PhD from the University of Athens in 2007. Her topic was solar cosmic ray physics. And uh, uh, during her PhD, she developed a space weather model for the determination of the response uh, of the near Earth space environment to solar energetic particle events, and in particular for the reconstruction of the particle spectrum. She then moved to Italy and uh, she joined the National Institute of Astrophysics. And uh, then she focused on the interactions of plasma and energetic particles with the environments of planetary bodies in the inner and outer solar system with a special emphasis on icy moons like Europa and Ganymede. Since uh, 2017, Christina has been a staff researcher of the Italian Space Agency. So regarding awards, Christina was awarded in 2014, a very prestigious European award for uh, space physics, the EGU Outstanding Young Scientist Award uh, in the, from the European Geosciences Union. Um, and um, Christina today contributes to, to many space missions. Just a few that we can mention here is the Juice mission and the Pepe Colombo mission, um, as well as the Juno mission. Um, she's also a panelist of the SCOS per panel on space weather and the ESF solar system exploration panel. And Christina has published more than 100 uh, papers and uh, has given uh, a large number of invited talks and seminars. Uh, as well as invited lectures. So um, I would like to welcome Christina and uh, give the floor to her now for her talk. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Yorgos, for, uh, for the nice uh, introduction. And uh, thank you all for uh, being here. It's always a pleasure for me to, to give talks uh, for the Greek uh, scientific community. Um, I apologize for not uh, turning on my video camera, but uh, since I use a uh, hotspot of uh, the cellular phone, I prefer not to not to risk uh, too much. Maybe in the end of the talk, uh, during the discussion and uh, questions uh, phase. So today I'm going to talk about uh, space weather in the solar system and uh, discuss uh, key science drivers in the context of uh, solar system exploration giving also some, uh, some recent examples. Uh, so this is the outline of my talk. After a brief introduction on planetary space weather science and uh, why we think it is important to, to study it, I will, um, I will uh, briefly discuss some basics for space weather, especially for uh, the part of the audience who is uh, working on, uh, on different uh, topics uh, in research. And then I uh, will uh, put the focus uh, in uh, a less traditional case of space weather. Let's uh, call it like this. Uh, I will focus uh, the talk on the space weather uh, mechanism and physics in the outer solar system, in particular in the Jupiter system. And uh, then I will pass in describing some uh, examples from some recent examples in this uh, field from solar system exploration missions. And finally, I will discuss uh, some conclusions and some uh, wider perspectives, always in view of uh, exploration. So space weather is uh, the discipline that uh, aims uh, through observation, understanding uh, and prediction uh, methods to, to understand the mechanisms that take place uh, on the sun, in the interplanetary and planetary environments, uh, a discipline that aims also to understand the potential impacts uh, that the, the various disturbances in these environments can have uh, on biological and uh, technological systems. And finally, also with the scope uh, to define uh, some countermeasures and some uh, pre prediction protection uh, strategies. 
So from the scientific point of view, uh, space weather is the physical and phenomenological state of the natural space environments. And uh, already taking into account this, uh, this definition, one can easily understand that the space weather conditions around a planet or a satellite are strongly uh, linked to the interactions that take place between the environment and its outer space. So uh, any planetary space weather phenomenon cannot be disconnected from the temporal variability of either the solar activity, especially if we talk about space weather in the inner solar system, until at least until the distance of Mars, or when we move uh, f further uh, outside, uh, the space weather phenomena cannot be disconnected from the variability of the magnetospheric plasma behavior inside, for example, planetary systems. And there are some uh, recent or less recent uh, reviews on, on these uh, subjects. Uh, you can find some things in these papers and uh, the references uh, therein. So this is uh, a figure that, uh, in my opinion, uh, presents uh, in a brief but precise uh, way uh, the variety and uh, the, the, the big number of phenomena that uh, are involved in uh, what we call uh, space weather. So on this slide, you see uh, phenomena that are related to the sources of space weather on the sun, and you see flare, the flares, uh, so solar energetic particle generation, acceleration, other phenomena like the solar wind stream uh, interactions, and uh, all these uh, phenomena, they, they propagate in interplanetary space. So we have uh, a whole uh, field of, uh, of study that uh, regards, for example, the mechanism of acceleration of solar energetic particles and the propagation of coronal mass ejections and other uh, disturbances from the sun until um, the vicinity of a planetary environment. And then uh, we have uh, phenomena that are related uh, precisely with the interaction of these disturbances uh, with uh, the, the planetary environment. And with the word environment, uh, we may intend uh, different places. For example, on this slide, you see the, the Earth case, so you see the magnetosphere, so we have a series of uh, phenomena and events that take place uh, in the magnet on the magnetopause, but also inside the magnetosphere, radiation belts, and then we have space weather phenomena that influence also the atmosphere and the ionosphere. And uh, sometimes when uh, the events uh, are extreme from the, from, from the energetics point of view, we can have also signatures of space weather events even on the surface uh, of the Earth, but even under the surface. And this is the case of the magnetic induced uh, currents. And uh, there is also a, a recently developed uh, field of uh, research, of scientific and technological research that um, regards uh, the study of the effects of space weather on avionics and telecommunication systems, but also on uh, electronics and components on board uh, satellites uh, at one astronomical unit, but even uh, beyond. And uh, also the study of the impacts of uh, space weather phenomena, especially radiation on uh, the astronaut, uh, for example, safety. So uh, this means that uh, the space weather science is uh, an inter and a transdisciplinary challenge. And uh, if we want to deeply understand uh, the origin of space weather, uh, the effects and, and, and every single detail of the whole space weather chains, uh, um, of, of the whole space weather chain, uh, we need uh, to put into action uh, different uh, fields, different uh, sub-disciplines uh, of, of physics. And here you see the, the main, uh, the main uh, ones that are interested in space weather, galactic cosmic ray physics, solar physics, geomagnetism, solar terrestrial physics, physics of the terrestrial ionosphere, and also the study of technological and biological impacts of space weather. And uh, expanding these uh, ideas uh, to the whole solar system, one uh, can easily understand that all these phenomena, of course, uh, in, in a different uh, range, uh, can take place also at other planets. And here uh, I substituted the, the Earth uh, with Mercury, which uh, is uh, the planetary the planetary body closer to the sun, the planet closer to the sun, a small planet with a relatively um, uh, weak magnetic field, nevertheless uh, very dynamic uh, since it is in a continuous interplay with uh, with the sun. 
Mercury's magnetic field uh, is an intrinsic one. Uh, it is uh, very weak, about 200 nanotesla at uh, the surface of the equator. This is even weaker than the Ganymede case, which is a moon uh, within the Jovian uh, planetary system. I will talk about this later. And uh, there are currently, there is currently one uh, very interesting mission of ESA and JAXA, the Beta Colombo mission, which uh, among others will study also the space weather uh, phenomena that take place in the vicinity of Mercury using two spacecraft around uh, this uh, small but very interesting from the planetary space weather perspective uh, planet. So of course we have other planets. So we have Venus here, which uh, does not possess an intrinsic magnetic field but has a strong uh, atmosphere and an induced uh, magnetosphere. Uh, a very interesting body also, also currently there are various missions also of NASA organized uh, pl planned for, uh, for Venus. And uh, one can imagine also Mars, uh, an interesting uh, body also from uh, the human space exploration perspective. There, is, um, there are several missions that are planned uh, for Mars. I, I will not talk about this today. However, uh, there have been also missions like, for example, MAVEN, which studied also space weather aspects and the way uh, they influenced, for example, the, the evolution of Mars. And I'm talking about the material that is, escapes from the atmosphere uh, of Mars uh, through the years. Um, so this is the field of planetary space weather. And uh, when we talk about planetary space weather, uh, we can even think uh, about the phenomena that take place in the outer solar system, meaning from uh, Jupiter, uh, from Jupiter and beyond. So on this slide, you see the four uh, giant planets of our uh, of our solar system: Jupiter, uh, Saturn, Uranus, uh, and Neptune. And when we refer to space weather phenomena at uh, those environments, uh, we refer to phenomena that take place in the circumplanetary environment of the giant planet, meaning the upper atmosphere, the ancient belts, its rings, etc., or on the, in the environments around, uh, around the moons. These are uh, environments, for example, exospheres, atmospheres, but even surfaces. And in the case of Ganymede, uh, also magnetospheres. Uh, at that point, I would like to, to stress out, uh, we'll talk more in detail later, that Ganymede is the only moon in the solar system that possesses an intrinsic magnetic field. And for this reason, it is very, very interesting uh, to study. So uh, for space weather, the distance from the sun of the, of the planet uh, plays, uh, plays a very important uh, role in the sun-planet interactions, which manifest through, through different uh, modes. For example, the deformation of the shape of the magnetosphere, but also other, uh, other phenomena. Uh, what is important that we know is that uh, also the conditions at that distances from the sun are, uh, are very important. For example, solar wind density, which varies uh, from 0.3 centimeters cube at Jupiter at 0 0.008, uh, almost at uh, the distance of uh, Neptune. And uh, also the inclination of the interplanetary magnetic field uh, is different uh, due to the, the Parker spiral and uh, also the intensity of the um, interplanetary magnetic field. What we need to, to, to remember is that the planetary rotation in case of giant planetary systems is an important uh, reason, uh, acts as a source for a particle acceleration within, uh, within the system um, itself. And the space weather conditions in general within the system depend on the properties of the system uh, itself. So why we care, why we need to, to study planetary space weather? Uh, first of all, we are scientists and we, are, uh, we have scientific interest, meaning that we need to study the basic physics behind space weather to test our theories and our scenarios for the various mechanisms that take uh, place and uh, to bring our current models, which are mostly for the Earth case, to their extreme limits in a comparative science approach. Um, then uh, we are interested in solar system exploration. We need to understand and uh, discover new worlds, also planetary habitats, and uh, to, to be able to interpret what, uh, what we will measure uh, in the next years, what, what we are currently measuring uh, with the exploration mis missions, we need to interpret correctly the scientific data, data we get. 
Uh, and to do this, we need to know if a space weather event, for example, uh, takes place at the same time we take our measurements. And uh, there are various um, examples of the past of why this is important. I will uh, refer uh, to the one uh, regarding the Mars Express uh, mission um, some, some years ago, uh, where uh, we had uh, the ASPERA the analyzer of space plasma and energetic atoms uh, instrument on board Mars, Mars Express, which needed to evaluate uh, the ion escape from Mars, a very important topic also understanding this in this period. And uh, Aspera had some problems to, to read the data because at the same time, uh, a space weather event uh, was, uh, was into action. Uh, so, uh, even if, uh, let's say, our, our detector uh, is not sat saturated, even in, in that case, we need to know what uh, part of the measurement uh, we, we have is due to an external phenomenon, a transient phenomenon that takes place, and what is the, the, the part that we need to know, for example, to evaluate the ion escape for Mars at that case. And some more details you can see in the nice paper by Futana of 2008. And uh, last but not least, uh, to, to understand better the circumterrestrial space weather, the phenomena that take place in, in our home, uh, it is very useful, uh, as always in physics, to have in mind the global picture. And to do this, uh, we need to, to look also outside our, our planet to, to understand the same phenomena, but uh, at different ranges. And this is a scientific interest, but there is a, an, a huge technological and operational interest, as, as you already know. Also, it is, it is also very evident also to the various plans and programs of, of ESA and uh, the European uh, community. Okay, there is technological and operational interest because, because we need to develop, test, and validate space weather forecasting tools. This uh, to keep space component, components and satellites safe, either at one astronomical unit or beyond. And to do this, we need to advance uh, what uh, we know right now. We need to, to improve our predictive capabilities for space weather. And to do this, we need to be based on the best science available. So uh, one more time, we need to go and see outside our, uh, our neighborhood to better understand the phenomena we want to predict and uh, to better define also our uh, protection uh, strategies and our uh, future countermeasures. And also in view of solar system exploration, we need to design spacecraft and payloads and components that are either resistant to space weather, even extreme space weather, especially if we are going to explore environments that we currently do not uh, know how they are made. So uh, some basics from the circumterrestrial case. Uh, this, uh, I suppose most of you are very familiar with these pictures. The main drivers for circumterrestrial space weather are solar flares, coronal mass ejections, and uh, also solar wind stream interactions. There are various reviews. I will not uh, focus on this uh, in this uh, in this talk. There are various and very nice uh, reviews uh, recently. And on this uh, figure, um, you see. Uh, some um, you see on the right the coronal mass ejections and you see the two ribbon flare on, on the left uh, part of, of the image of a specific uh, space weathering event of 10 years ago and uh, such events uh, are very often accompanied by also by particle fluxes and we have uh, what we call a solar energetic particle event uh, at one astronomical unit, and uh, such events uh, can be uh, measured uh, by satellites uh, at one astronomical unit, and sometimes uh, when we have events that are uh, very energetic, uh, energetic enough to, to be able to, to pass uh, the magnetic obstacle of the Earth, they can also um, provide uh, signatures at ground levels, and this is what we call a ground level enhancement uh, event. It can be also registered uh, on the ground by special uh, monitors, uh, which uh, are called uh, neutron monitors. So also here, there are various uh, reviews, various efforts ongoing on, on this subject. And uh, from a planetary space weather perspective, I would like to point out that we have uh, this kind of events, ground level enhancement events, observed also at different planets. 
And on uh, 10 September 2017, we had uh, the first ground level enhancement uh, event that was observed uh, at the Earth and at another planet. Of course, not at the same time, since uh, these planets uh, are at different distance from the sun. Uh, however, on Mars, uh, there was uh, the radiation uh, instrument on board uh, the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity rover since 2012. And as you see on the left side of, of, of the figure, uh, there was an increase of uh, the radiation register on the ground, an increase with respect to the galactic cosmic rays that were already registered. As you see here, there is also a Forbus decrease that was detected at a later uh, hour um, from the same instrument. And on the right, uh, there was a GLE. It was a small, uh, relatively small uh, GLE. Here are the polar neutron monitors that registered this, um, this event. And you can find some more details on this uh, event and the methodology in this nice paper by, by our colleagues of 2018. So planetary magnetic uh, fields uh, are very important for, uh, for space uh, weather. And uh, as you see here, uh, mag planetary magnetic fields are, uh, are very different. On the first uh, row here, you see the strongly magnetized bodies of our solar system, Mercury, Jupiter, and Saturn, that have magnetic fields that are uh, within 10 degrees from the spin axis, uh, regular, um, strongly dipolar uh, magnetic fields. Contrary to the um, Uranus the, and Neptune magnetic fields, these are the ice giants, of our solar system, very regular magnetic fields. As you see, uh, they are strongly offset with high order uh, components, uh, which of course result in very irregular uh, magnetospheres. So magnetic fields are, are important. Uh, the morphology of the magnetosphere is important for planetary space weather, but uh, also the plasmas uh, are, are important. Different magnetospheres, big range of scales. And uh, I would like to discuss a little of this, uh, this nice table by Professor Fran Bagenal from Colorado. And uh, here you see some characteristics of uh, uh, the planetary magnetic fields of our solar system. Uh, I remind you the tilt, which is the angle between the magnetic and rotational axis. And you see here uh, there are uh, varies strongly within the solar system. And um, at the same time, uh, you see that uh, for the significantly magnetized bodies, there is a big range in the magnetic moments, but a small range in the solar system in the surface field intensities. As you see here, Jupiter is the strongest, uh, has the strongest magnetic field in the solar system. Uh, these are uh, recent measurements uh, by the Juno mission. I will talk to the, about this uh, later. Um, okay, and... Um, uh, also, uh, if one uh, takes into account the ratio of maximum surface field to minimum, which is uh, equal to two for a center dipole field. Also here, you see uh, that we have some ranges uh, between two and uh, almost 4.6 uh, uh, between uh, Earth to the Saturn and uh, for the strongly irregular magnetic fields of Uranus and Neptune, uh, where we have offset magnetic fields and uh, the structures are extremely complex, uh, this ratio becomes um, becomes uh, increased. Uh, so we have uh, different uh, plasma sources uh, within uh, the various systems. And uh, please remember, for the outer solar system case, planetary rotation uh, is one of the, the most uh, uh, important accelerators uh, for plasma and energetic particles within the system. Um, just to point out that, uh, as I said before, uh, we are expecting new results and very interesting in the coming years from Bebe Colombo. We already have some, uh, some data, some first papers from the cruise phase. We had also a Mercury flyby recently uh, and uh, stay tuned. Uh, to, to better understand the planetary space weather in the inner, very inner solar system. At the same time, uh, we have continuous updates on, on the physics and the interactions between plasma and uh, environments within the Jupiter system that are coming out from the NASA Juno mission these days. And I will talk about this later in the presentation. So this is a comparative uh, figure always uh, from uh, Fran Banker and Steve uh, Barlett that shows uh, the magnetospheres of uh, 
of these uh, bodies uh, scale to the radius of the planet. And as you see also here, Jupiter is an extreme environment with the largest magnetosphere that extends uh, up to at least uh, 80 radius of the planet at the magnetopause and with an enormous tail and the current sheet um, on, on, the, uh, on the opposite uh, side. So uh, this was the background, but uh, space weather manifestations, uh, where do we have to look for them? Okay, the, the environments where we look for are, of course, the magnetospheres themselves, the upper atmospheres of the planet, the ionospheres. When we talk about moons, the surface-bounded exospheres, these are uh, exospheres, meaning uh, env neutral environments um, that are... Uh, uh, very um, uh, are, are not dense uh, at all, meaning that the mean free path of, of the particles is of the order of the scale height. So very weak uh, environments, which is the case, for example, for Europa, Ganymed, Callisto in the Jupiter system and other, other moons. These are the main regions where space weather is manifested, uh, but of course also inside atmospheres and also, as I said before, at the ground. So, uh, of course, data are, are necessary to understand what is going on, uh, but uh, also modeling is a strong tool for us at the current moment for understanding the underlying physics. Um, and uh, this becomes even stronger as a tool if we apply our models um, using a comparative science uh, methodology. So now we'll uh, pass uh, to the main part of, of the talk, which is the Jovian system. As you see here, uh, this is the dominant magnetosphere where space weather phenomena have their origins at the plasma and energetic particles uh, within that system. You see here the four Galilean uh, moons uh, named like this uh, because they were discovered by Galileo. Um, you see Io, a volcanic moon, and uh, the three uh, icy satellites, Europa, Ganymed, and Callisto. Uh, all these moons are embedded within the magnetosphere. As you see, the orbital uh, plane of these moons is tilted with respect to the Jupiter plasma sheet because also the magnetic field of Jupiter is uh, tilted. So, as I said before, we have a strong uh, magnetic field of Jupiter. Uh, the, the main dipole is tilted about 10 degrees. The plasma sources are uh, volcanic activity of, uh, of EO, uh, but also Europa through the escape of particles from its tenuous atmosphere, its exosphere, and also Ganymed uh, may be a source. And we have uh, different energetic ions observed until now with Galileo, but also Juno is uh, observing uh, these types of ions. We have oxygen and sulfur ions, heavy ions, but also uh, hydrogen ions. Um, so here uh, is Ganymed. Ganymed, uh, as I said before, is the only moon in the solar system that possesses an intrinsic magnetic field of the order of 700 nanotesla on the surface, on the equator. And being Ganymed within the Jovian magnetosphere, um, this creates the conditions for a reconnection at the, uh, on the left figure, for example, you see the magneto uh, pose uh, the, the, the reconnection uh, on, on the left side and also the tail reconnection on the right side. Please note that this figure, uh, Ganymed goes from the left to the right if Jupiter is behind your computers. Uh, so this is the, let's say, the orbital um, direction of Ganymed. The plasma comes uh, on the orbital direction but with much higher velocity than the orbital velocity itself. Calculate that the plasma is about 100 something of uh, kilometers uh, per second, whereas the velocity of the moon is of some uh, 10, 15 kilometers per second. So the plasma overtakes the satellite, but uh, the way it hits uh, its tenuous atmosphere and surface uh, is strongly determined by the um, reconnection uh, properties. And this uh, was also known before uh, our modeling, uh, let's say, efforts, uh, because Hubble, on the right side of, of, of the slide, uh, observed the auroral activity. These are uh, electrons that are coming from the um, electron impact uh, dissociative the excitation of molecular oxygen. It's about 1,356 angstrom as, uh, as wavelength. And as you see here also, the morphology reflects exactly the, the limit uh, between open and closed magnetic field lines on uh, Ganymed. 
so there are some recent papers on, on this and on the variability because I always remember that uh, when we talk about planetary space weather, we intend variability. Space weather is strongly synonym with the variability. So all of these phenomena are, uh, are not static, are dynamic and depend on the conditions of the plasma near in the near uh, satellite uh, region. And there is some uh, nice work on this uh, by Zhu et al. 2020. So here uh, you see these, uh, the plas Jupiter plasma sheet, uh, this nice uh, figure by Bertrand Bonfond that presents um, uh, the Jupiter plasma sheet. And as the moon, as you see, it is tilted, the orbital plane is tilted with respect to the plasma sheet. As the moon orbits around Jupiter, it passes uh, through different uh, regions of this plasma sheet, meaning uh, regions of higher density, slower density, and also the magnetic field interactions, the interaction between the Jovian magnetic field and the Ganymede magnetic field changes. This means that also the ion circulation changes at different orbits. So we have regions where Ganymede is below the center of the Jupiter plasma sheet, regions where it's near the center, and regions where it's above. And these are conditions that uh, the Galileo spacecraft in the 90s, uh, the Galileo mission by NASA, phased when uh, orbited Jupiter. And we have uh, several measurements of the magnetic fields, but also of the plasma environments and the ion circulation uh, situation at, uh, at these different conditions. It's uh, the G8 uh, flyby, for example, is the case where Ganymede was near the center of the plasma sheet. So we took into account uh, these, uh, these cases. Uh, we tried uh, to understand how the magnetic field was was formed at the epoch of Galileo, and we performed some, um, some simulations to understand how the ion environment was, uh, was during those flybys. Also to understand what we expect to, 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 to see right now, that we have Juno uh, that is exploring the, um, the Jovian system, and because we will have also other missions in the Jovian system in the next years. For example, the esa Jus uh, mission. Which will be there, uh, which will be launched in um, next year, in 2023. So uh, these were, uh, I, I do not go into details in, in the model, uh, but uh, of course you can ask me during the questions uh, uh, part of, of the seminar. Uh, these are the results of our model. We have described this model firstly in 2015 in our uh, paper in Icarus. And then we had done some simulations in 2020 and some improved versions uh, in 2022. Our paper is, uh, is just uh, accepted by APJ. So here you see the case of uh, 30 keV oxygen uh, doubly charged uh, for uh, these three uh, different situations. Uh, as you see, the, the middle uh, panel, uh, which reflects the case where Ganymede is uh, near the center of the plasma sheet, we have the highest intensity, but but it is uh, more than obvious uh, that uh, the morphology of, uh, of this ion circulation changes um, in a significant way between one passage and the other, meaning that uh, when we will orbit Ganymede with Zeus um, in, ten in more than 10 years from now, we will, uh, we will need uh, to know uh, what kind of environment we are going to, to explore because uh, at each different phase, different environments are, are expected. And this is the case of oxygen, which is a heavy ion and 30 keV uh, energy. So recently we tried to understand how critical is the observation altitude, for example, for understanding the effect of space weather on the surface. We have these ions. Some of these ions do precipitate on the surface following the morphology of the magnetic field lines. How critical is it to observe them, uh, to observe them uh, from a specific altitude? Um, to do this, we perform some simulations, and uh, here you see, for example, the simulations corresponding to sulfur ions with energy of 10 keV, a little less than uh, the previous case, on the surface, on the left, at, at 500 kilometers on the right. As you see also here, uh, the, the, the situation is not homogeneous. Uh, take into account that the 90 degrees of longitude corresponds uh, to the um, leading part of the, um, of the satellite. 
uh, and to the part where uh, we have increased flux coming out from tail reconnection. Tail reconnection is in the leading part since the plasma comes from the trailing side, as I mentioned in my previous slides. So here, you see the effects of tail reconnection. It's, it's, it's very similar to the one of the Earth during substorms, for example. And you see these effects that are, are seen even on the surface, of course, very, very intense, and also at 500 kilometers. But the, 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 the details determined from the exact morphology of the magnetic fields, as you see, they are better understood if, of course, we have a measurement near the surface. Of course, because the magnetic field there is stronger, and then the distinction between open and closed field lines is, uh, is better seen in the, on, on the data. Okay, these are simulations. Uh, let me point out that these are not data. These are simulations of the data we expect to measure in the, in the coming years. So, um, okay. Sorry. Uh, okay, so tail reconnection, as I said before, results in the precipitation of ions in the low latitude leading hemispheres through the tail reconnection effects. So the energy, uh, how important is the energy for these uh, ion surface interactions? Uh, here are, is the same type of ion, sulfur, but for uh, biggest uh, energies. And as you see here, uh, if, you, if you compare the, the left column with the right column, which are, are for different energy, 30 keV and 300 keV, as you see here, also the effects of reconnection are seen, but in a different way, the, the pattern changes with, with energy. And also this is very, very logical since we know that uh, the cutoff, the magnetic cutoff, even from the Earth case, we know, we know this. Uh, the cutoff is different. It, 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 uh, it depends on the rigidity, which is uh, the momentum per charge. So it is, uh, for example, these effects in uh, the, the higher um, energy are uh, ions are more rigid. Uh, they do not feel so much the, um, the field, the, the magnetic field. So uh, all these events, uh, all these uh, phenomena that are uh, intrinsically phenomena of space weather, do they have an, an effect on uh, ion surface interactions? Uh, just to convince you about this from a first uh, glance, I show you here uh, the leading and the trailing part of uh, Ganymede. Uh, through our simulations, uh, oxygen ions, 30 keV of uh, initial energy. And as you see here, the leading and the trailing side, the, the precipitation of the surface is completely different. You see here on, on the trailing part, there is a big region that is, it is strongly shielded because it's where, uh, let's say, in the trailing side where the magnetic field strongly uh, shields this the surface regions uh, until at least 45 degrees more or less of latitude from the incoming uh, particles energetic particles and plasma on the leading side uh, this is um, less evident because uh, on the leading side and above the leading hemisphere we have the tail reconnection which in the end redirects ions and brings them back to the surface so we have low latitude regions on the leading hemisphere, which get uh, strongly bombarded by ions and, and plasma due to the reconnection taking place there. Uh, so here uh, we compare heavy and light ions of the same energy. And as uh, you see here, uh, the oxygen ions are, uh, are more rigid for the same energy because they are heavier. So they, I mean, they are less, uh, less determined the, the, their trajectory from the magnetic field with respect to, to low mass ions like hydrogen. Uh, this, of course, can function the other way around, uh, meaning that uh, if we observe the low mass ions like hydrogen, in reality, we have a way to understand exactly the morphology of the magnetic field, since uh, the, their detection can function as a tracer for, uh, for this environment. Uh, so recently, Juno observed, uh, observed these, uh, these environments. Uh, these uh, are some recent uh, figures uh, in Paranica et al. Uh, on the right side, there is a fit uh, of, um, of protons 
uh, as uh, they observed by the jade and the jade instrument and on the on, on the left side uh, the electrons uh, note that these are not simulations meaning these these are snapshots of, uh, of at the moment that Juno passed uh, Ganymede let me tell you that um, there were uh, in 2021 in June and July there were two uh, quick uh, flybys of uh, Juno of Ganymede I will talk about this uh, a little later. So trying to get the whole picture uh, together, there are various models, not only our own one, which I just presented in the slides. There are also other uh, MHD models, for example, like the one of Sahar Fatemi of 2016 and other uh, works that followed, which in the end uh, shows uh, the, the whole idea of precipitation of ions on Ganymede surface. As you see here, uh, it is uh, not homogeneous. Uh, certain regions of Ganymede are strongly bombarded by ions, other less. And these results, although the models we used, uh, for example, the model by FATEM is a hybrid model, um, whereas our own one is a single particle uh, model. Uh, the whole idea, however, it is very similar between, uh, between these, uh, these models. This is a recent work by Lucas Liuzzo on the electrons. It's a very similar situation as the one we calculated for the ions. And as you see, also in this case, uh, the moon is shielded, of course, from electrons due to its magnetic field. And also here, we expect different uh, patterns of precipitation for the, for the electrons uh, in the environment of uh, Ganymede. Uh, but all these uh, charged particle environments have effects also on the neutral environment. Since uh, we are talking about uh, bodies that do not possess strong uh, atmospheres around them, but exospheres, as I said before, the whole idea is that the interaction between plasma and energetic particles with the surface of the, of the moon uh, leads to a, a series of phenomena, like, for example, sputtering or radiolysis of ice, which in the end result in the release of uh, of, uh, of particles uh, in the exosphere, mainly water, but also water products like uh, molecular hydrogen uh, or uh, oxygen. We have also other effects, like for, uh, for example, um, sublimation. Of course, sublimation is a very local thermal process that has its maximum, of course, on, uh, uh, on the noon uh, local time when, uh, when the moon is uh, illuminated. Uh, nevertheless, the whole uh, thing uh, creates a very complex uh, environment because on the, on, from the one hand, we have the interaction between the charged particle environment with the surface. We have the release of particles and then we have a series of loss processes that include the uh, genes escape or charge exchange and uh, gravitational escape and neutral particle ionization and pickup. And uh, the whole idea uh, creates a space weather scenario which uh, is uh, particularly complex, but particularly uh, interesting uh, to study. For example, uh, when we want to understand uh, how what happens on the surface uh, after the bombardment by, by energetic particles, one needs to, to, to study the, the yield, the efficiency with which uh, the, the surface releases particles. And just to give you an idea, uh, a whole new world um, opens at, that, at this point, because, for example, 2017, we did a very nice uh, work with uh, my colleague from Southwest Research Institute, uh, Ben Teolis, on the release of particles, of oxygen particles from the surface of, um, of icy satellites, putting together uh, all the laboratory experiments we had and trying to parameterize and uh, to get uh, um, an empirical relation uh, on the dependence, for example, of this efficiency on temperature. And the same thing can happen, for example, for the yield of uh, water release. Indeed, some years ago, we tried to understand what happens with the water exosphere of, uh, of Ganymede. And this is another model uh, that we did on the epoch. And uh, as we see here uh, on the left, um, the water exosphere reflects uh, the particle circulation, the, the charged particle circulation around Ganymede, whereas the oxygen exosphere, for a series of reasons that I don't have the time now to go into more detail, the oxygen exosphere has a different uh, morphology, which is uh, mainly due to, to the bouncing, the multiple bouncing of the released uh, particles. Uh, so these works have been uh, also, um, let's say, uh, followed 
and improved by other colleagues, um, experts in, on the field. And this is a very recent paper uh, by my colleague uh, Audrey Forburger from the University of, uh, of Bern, uh, where uh, they studied uh, a model uh, for the water density profiles at Ganymed. The uh, model is in, in, in agreement also with our uh, own one of 2015. Uh, this collect uh, tried also to, to link uh, their studies uh, also with the JUICE mission that uh, will uh, take place in the next uh, years, trying to understand uh, what are the also uh, the fluxes that we expect from the various um, populations of the Ganymede exosphere, also as a function of the altitude at which uh, the spacecraft uh, will go to, to observe. And for more details, please. Uh, have a look at the paper by Audrey and team. Uh, and then we try to understand the weathering due to weather, space weathering, which is the alteration of the surface due to, due to its interaction with space as a result of space weather, which you all know what it is. So uh, to do this, uh, we try to estimate, taking into account also the different conditions during the orbit of the moon around Jupiter, we try to estimate the sputter water rate uh, for different uh, ions, the total one, and for different conditions, and then uh, doing uh, an efficient, let's say, averaging of these uh, rates. So we concluded that almost uh, eight kilograms per second is a sputter mass from uh, from Ganymed that uh, comes from from that is released from its surface after its interaction with the space environment. But of this, if we take into account the, um, let's say, the, um, the energy spectrum of, of this material and uh, the, the gravitational, the expected gravitational escape, we estimate that in the end, about one kilogram per second is the mass that the moon uh, is losing. This is a small amount, especially if compared to the, to the amount calculated for the Europa case in the papers of the past. For example, by Schreier and uh, Joachim Saur of 1998. Uh, so, okay, some recent uh, insights. Uh, I would like um, very briefly to, to um, discuss a little uh, about the Juno mission. Uh, Juno is an, a mission by NASA, an innovative planetary mission, uh, exploration mission uh, to study Jupiter. The main goal of Juno is to answer questions about the origin and evolution of Jupiter and our solar system, providing at the same time key measurements also for understanding giant planets across uh, the universe. So Juno was uh, launched on uh, 5 August 2011 from Cape Canaveral, as you see on the left. And uh, after a travel, uh, arrived at Jupiter on the 4th of uh, July 2016. And uh, Juno uses a spinning solar-powered spacecraft, uh, which is ideal for magnetospheric uh, instruments, meaning that it um, does one rotation every 30 seconds. And it has uh, a highly elliptical orb orbit that avoids uh, the radiation belts, uh, stretching from above the top of the clouds uh, until um, the faraway magnetosphere. As you see here, uh, during the prime mission uh, phase, uh, the, um, the orbit um, uh, lasted about 53 days, uh, whereas near the end of the prime mission, uh, it was decided uh, to, to reduce this uh, orbit uh, some days in order to reach higher latitudes and lower altitudes above the Jupiter's pole. Uh, this, of course, will uh, allow um, a better, uh, let's say, a better study of uh, of the of the planet but also of, of the of the system of Jupiter itself um, as you see here we were um, we, we entered the, in the in the extended mission in uh, June almost June 2020 21 so during its extended uh, mission uh, see here during its extended mission, Juno will expand several scientific aspects uh, of the discoveries already made uh, about Jupiter. Uh, there will be a special focus uh, on the study of Aurora. Uh, I will talk about this. And on the study of the roots of the cyclones in Jupiter's atmosphere. But at the same time, uh, Juno will address new science questions, for example, on planetary habitats. And to do this, uh, as the orbit uh, will continue to evolve, there will be several Europa and EO flybys which will provide new data, for example, um, on their clouds uh, and, other, uh, and other science 
uh, questions. So here, uh, as you see, this is uh, this is the probe of uh, the Juno probe. There are several um, payloads uh, on on board uh, Juno uh, that are uh, visible uh, infrared uh, UV remote sensors. There is the radio science experiment, the, the microwave uh, radiometer, some charged particle uh, detectors, and uh, two magnetometers. So all these um, payloads um, provide data uh, across a wide range of disciplines. And at this point, I would like to, to say that uh, as the Italian agency, we contributed to the mission through two, through, um, uh, two uh, important experiments. The one is the Jovian Infrared Auroral Mapper, uh, which uh, was developed by Film Mechanica, uh, Leonardo uh, at Firenze, and uh, under uh, scientific leadership of the National Institute of Astrophysics, uh, ENAF, as he coordinated and financed uh, the whole uh, project. And then the other uh, contribution of Italy was uh, the Gravity Science Experiment, the CAT Radio Science Instrument, um, which is the gravity experiment in practice, which was manufactured by Thales Alenia Space, uh, Italia, and uh, under the scientific uh, leadership of the University of Rome, La Sapienza. Uh, so one of the important uh, phenomena that uh, Juno uh, studied uh, at Jupiter, and in particular our instrument, uh, the GRAM instrument studied uh, at, um, at Jupiter was the infrared aurora. We are all usually very familiar with the UV aurora, but uh, the H3 plus Aurora Jupiter is a very interesting phenomenon, which is the result, for example, of the, of the precipitation of uh, electrons uh, to, uh, to, the, to the, the molecular hydrogen atmosphere of, of Jupiter, uh, ionizes uh, the molecular hydrogen, which uh, then reacts uh, with the neutral atmosphere, producing H3 plus uh, with an excess of energy, which is retained and release as rotova vibrational energy, meaning in the infrared, uh, centered around 3.3 uh, uh, microns. Uh, so this uh, usually, but not always, is in thermal equilibrium with the neutral atmosphere. And uh, when this happens, the spectrum of the emission depends on the local temperature. So meaning that when we observe the H3 plus aurora Jupiter, we have an instantaneous picture of the particle precipitation. And this is why space weather is interested in this process, as this happens in the UV. And then by monitoring these uh, images, uh, we, we have a way to monitor the H3 plus column density and temperature. So our instrument uh, studied this uh, phenomena. This is our instrument, the, GIF, the GRAM, Jovian Infrared Auroral Mapper. This is um, an image spectrometer in the infrared. It was carried us from another instrument, which was called VIRTIS, and it, um, it flew uh, in the Rosetta mission, but also in the Venus Express mission. And it was developed uh, by Leonardo at uh, Officine Galileo in Firenze. And uh, the detectors uh, were provided by an American company, Rayton. So GRAM combined two uh, data channels, uh, images and spectra, in a single instrument. We have uh, two imagers sent uh, in, in the range uh, 4.54 micron until 5.03 uh, micron. And the L imager, the Aurora um, yeah, channel, uh, sent around 3.3 microns. And then we have the spectrometer providing the spectrum operating between two and five microns. And at each rotation, uh, GRAM acquires simultaneously either an M or an L image, and at the same time, uh, 256 spectra at different points uh, on, on space. So this is an, a, an image uh, which uh, was published first time in science um, by Conor Nital, 2017. And as you see here, uh, the spectacular image, which, if I'm not mistaken, was also the cover of, uh, of the journal. And um, on the right side, you see also uh, the spectral color ratio, uh, which is a diagnostic uh, also of uh, temperature. So the thickness also there is variable. And uh, studying this, uh, in reality, we have an idea of... Uh, of the environment and its variability from a space weather perspective. But the infrared aurora is also produced uh, through other processes, not only uh, the electrons of the magnetosphere themselves, but uh, through the interaction between a moon 
and, and, and the planet itself. And why this happens? This happens because we have the Alven waves that travel uh, along the magnetic field line that connects, for example, a satellite with uh, the ionosphere of Jupiter. And uh, this, uh, these Alven waves um, can develop a parallel electric field which accelerates electrons into the atmosphere of uh, Jupiter. And uh, this produces auroral uh, emissions. These waves are par partially reflected by plasma density gradients and other inhomogeneities in the Alven speed. And this leads to multiple bounces and nonlinear wave evolution. As a result, we see near the main aurora on, uh, on the planet, these, uh, the so-called footprints of, of these satellites in the infrared. Also in UV, we see in, in all the rains, but here I talk about the infrared. And uh, I would like to show you this spectacular image uh, that uh, was, um, was published in Science 2018 by Mura et al. And uh, as you see here, uh, we have the main spot, which has an oval uh, shape with an angular offset from the average direction of the tail. And uh, here on the blue with the spot is the predicted uh, EO footprint um, trajectory. And uh, even here you see that EO, as happens also with Ganymede, has a double tail, as you see these uh, two arcs. We still do not know the exact physical mechanism that produces. We are sure that there are Alven waves that are involved in these processes and, and uh, revealing the properties of such waves, also using modeling, will be the key to explain these uh, images. Nevertheless, this is the first time we had the possibility to, to observe this, uh, this phenomena from, from that close. So uh, Juno provides also other, uh, other results, especially in the particle environment. I don't, I don't have much time now to, to go into more details on this, but uh, please have a look, uh, especially those of you that are interested in the particle environment uh, in the latest, uh, in the latest um, publications uh, from the Juno team. Uh, I don't know if many of you had the chance also to, to, to watch uh, some of these uh, presentations during uh, the last uh, successful meeting of COSPAR in Athens uh, last July. Uh, most of these works uh, were all were presented during that conference. And uh, there are also two, two, two interesting sites, uh, the one of NASA and the one of Southwest, uh, which uh, continuously provide updates on, uh, on the results of this uh, nice mission. So just to, to go towards a conclusion, um, I would like to point out that knowledge of planetary space weather conditions uh, in general uh, allows a better planning of the orbits of the observations uh, we do with, uh, with the missions, but also of the operations. And uh, to characterizing the environment, the exospheric background, for example, of a planetary body, and the space weather processes can provide uh, the necessary feedback we need in order to correct, uh, interpret the data we, we gather. And it would be very interesting to have uh, in the future uh, on um, astronomical missions, but also planetary, uh, a mini package uh, that uh, space weather pa monitoring package, let's call it, which would include at least a magnetometer or a plasma instrument uh, to be embarked uh, in the mission as a basic payload. This, uh, why we need this? This would be extremely interesting because it would give us the possibility to have always uh, more measurements, multi-point measurements of the entire solar system. And uh, this is this is an expensive thing to do on purpose, but it becomes uh, more uh, realistic if we imagine uh, a mini space weather monitoring package to embark in, uh, in, in, in various uh, missions. Um, another idea would be, for example, to have plasma instruments to continue and operate during also the cruise phase of uh, the missions, even if only at a very low data rate, uh, at least to continue to acquire data that we can uh, download uh, at a later moment. And in the future, we will have the chance to do more space weather, uh, more, more space weather at Jupiter. Uh, for example, ESA is now uh, in a very good phase uh, with the Zeus mission, which will be launched uh, 2023, uh, in April 2023. And uh, this uh, mission is dedicated to the exploration of the emergence of habitable worlds around gas giants and the study of Jupiter's system as an archetype. And there are several uh, important scientific objectives of the missions that uh, 
I cannot discuss right now, but from a planetary space weather uh, science perspective, the mission is uh, largely dedicated to investigation of the exosphere of Ganymede and to the study of its intrinsic magnetic field and its interactions with the Jovian magnetosphere. So, uh, sorry. So the um, the spacecraft will be in orbit around Jupiter uh, to 2031, uh, almost. And uh, there is a special um, orbital phase at 500 kilometers around Ganymede, which would last uh, from uh, May 2035 to the end of September 2035. And there, at that epoch we will hopefully have the chance to investigate, to have the data, to, to test and validate the models we are currently uh, developing uh, for, uh, for explaining and for investigating the environment of Ganymede. So to conclude, um, I would like to, to say that uh, understanding planetary space weather in the solar system is a scientific challenge. Um, there have been many missions that provided important uh, data at various uh, aspects. And uh, if we enter into the logic to study those data, uh, especially within a comparative planetary science framework, uh, in my opinion, uh, we will uh, be a big step forward towards uh, a more global and more detailed understanding of, uh, of the phenomena that take place in the solar system. Uh, syner synergies in science are uh, necessary. Uh, as you saw many times, we have to put into action our modeling uh, capacities, uh, but uh, together with data analysis and empirical uh, modeling and uh, data-driven modeling and uh, data analysis and even theoretical uh, um, approaches are uh, particularly important uh, in this field. So both from the interdisciplinarity of the data, but also from, uh, from the methodological approach that we apply, uh, space weather is uh, is a very complicated, but at the same time, a fascinating uh, uh, science uh, field uh, in, in, the, in the years to come. Uh, so uh, going into this direction, of course, can uh, help us to better uh, understand also the space weather in our own planets and to better constrain our models uh, to make uh, more accurate predictions of the various behavior of uh, of interest we have behavior of physical quantities of interest we have also for the earth case and uh, to do this as i said before it is important to have new data uh, hopefully from different locations uh, within uh, within the solar system so i would like to thank you very much for your attention uh, sorry if i went a little out of uh, of time and uh, many thanks also to Yorgos for, uh, for this invitation uh, today to give this talk. Thank you very much. So thank you, Christina. That was a wonderful talk, very informative.